Hare Krishna, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs> During this auspicious month of Karti. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. No board. Hare Krishna. We're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 47, The Song of the Bee. <laughs> this is text 57. Drishtvaivam <clears throat> apigopinam Krishna Vaishnatma Vikalavam Udava Parama Pritas Na Namasyan Idam Jago. Translation Thus seeing how the gopis were always disturbed because of their total absorption in Krishna, Uddhava was supremely pleased. Desiring to offer them all respect, he sang as follows. Please repeat. Thus seeing how the gopis were always disturbed because of their total absorption in Krishna, Uddhava was supremely pleased. Desiring to offer them all respect, he sang as follows. Purport. Viklava, mental disturbance, should not be confused here with ordinary material distress. It is clearly stated that Uddhava was supremely pleased and he felt this way because he saw that the gopis had attained the highest state of loving ecstasy. Uddhava was an exalted member of the court of Dwarka, an important minister in world political affairs, and yet he felt the spiritual urge to offer his obeisances to the glorious gopis, although externally they were mere cowherd girls in an insignificant village called Vrindavan. <laughs> <coughs> Thus to explain his feelings he sang the following verses. Srila Jiva Goswami states that Uddhava sang these verses daily while he was in Sri Vrindavan Dham. Obangyan timadandasya ginangana ashtalakaya chuksuna militam jena tasmaya si gudave namaha Sri Chaitanya mano vishtam shtapitam jena bhutale shvayam rupa kadam Jai Sri Krishna Jai So during his appearance on uh, earth, actually it's interesting because Krishna spent most of his time in Dwarka. Actually I was reading that he spent 100 years in Dwarka. That's actually longer than he spent in both uh, Mathura and Vrindavan. And as we know, <clears throat> as we can imagine, as one day we may experience, <clears throat> um, in Krishna's absence, the, the Vajrabhasis, the residents of Vrindavan, missed him very much. As much as you're attached to someone when they go away, you, to that degree you feel the, the intensity of separation. So as we often say, the, Brajabhasis, they loved Krishna more than anyone's ever been loved before. We're just beginning to understand what is the nature of that love. It can't be compared to love in this world. And Krishna loves the Brajabhasis. He loves all his devotees more than anyone's ever been loved before. Therefore, we're hoping to enter into that <coughs> transcendental relationship because love by nature is reciprocal. Although someone who first hears how Krishna left Vrindavan, um, they, it may sound a little cruel. He leaves Vrindavan where 
we'll find out later this is the purest love of any devotees, especially the love of the gopis, and he remained in uh, Dwarka. But why did he do that? <coughs> well, elegance is <coughs> truth spoken concisely. Separation makes the heart grow fonder. We even have that experience in our own lives, isn't it? We all love, and especially now we're trained, we're naturally loving Vaishnavas, we're loving our guru, we're beginning to love Krishna. And in separation from the Vaishnavas, and separation from the guru, separation from Krishna, we, we feel something. So separation makes the heart go fonder. And it's no secret. Krishna himself explains this, how can I put it, transcendental science. It's a science, Krishna consciousness. Science means you have a formula, you have a means to carry out the experiment, and you have the result. That's science, like H2O, two molecules of hydrogen, one of oxygen. It's the theory. Put it together, you get a drop of water. That's science. So this is a science. We're being taken from a fallen condition, chetu darpana marginam, we're gradually become purified, and one day we'll actually, it's true, we will experience that love for Krishna. We'll become overwhelmed with that love of Krishna. And sometimes to come to that point, Krishna may separate himself. <laughs> we're working so hard to come in contact with God, and then he walks away, like, wait a minute, I spent Vasudeva Savamati Samahatma Sadurabaha. Many lifetimes trying to achieve you. Where are you going, Mathura? <laughs> what? But it's a science because in that separation, our love grows. And that's made very clear by Krishna himself. You could say he's the Adi Guru, he's the fountainhead of all knowledge. And in 10th Canto, uh, chapter 32, verse 20, he reasons as such. He says, the reason I do not immediately reciprocate the affection of living beings, even when they worship me, O gopis, is that I want to intensify their loving devotion. They then become <coughs> like a poor man <coughs> who has gained some wealth and then lost it, and who thus becomes so anxious about it that he can think of nothing else. So Krishna, he leaves that fateful day. Mathura Mangalam, it's, it's actually, well, it's, that phrase is used, but it's a particular book written by an Arian saint. And one of my old friends who passed away from this world and went back to Galok, Fakir Mohan, he would sometimes sing the prayers in this particular poem about how Krishna was just ready to leave Vrindavan and all the residents came and they were crying and crying but the, the biggest tears and the most pain was felt by the gopis and they were actually lying down in front of the chariot ready to give up their lives. No Krishna, please, what would life be without you? And there's 108 prayers just about the gopis' sentiments of not wanting Krishna to leave. But he left. And while uh, Dwarka Krishna, <coughs> as a majestic king, was in Dwarka, he was surrounded by his opulences and unlimited, fully surrendered devotees. Another Bob. There, all the citizens of Dwarka, they worshipped him in Aishvarya Bhav. Aishvarya Bhav means uh, awe and reverence like in reverence to the, to, the, to the king, to your authority, which can also be a nice relationship. Sometimes I think of it in terms like, I was in the military one time and when we would approach our sergeant or our colonel or our lieutenant or general, we'd say, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> he asked us a question. <clears throat> we wouldn't just say yes, sir. The formality of the relationship. He was training us. Sir, yes, sir. So Dwarka is more formal than Vrindavan. And that's certainly a relishable mood. 
we shouldn't think ill of it because Krishna desires it. He likes that. As Gopu Kumar describes it in Brihad Bhagavatam Mita. Actually, at that particular point in Brihad Bhagavatam Mita, he's passing through the Dwarka. You know, there's the journey of Gopu Kumar. He sees different levels of practice of Krishna consciousness, different levels of expression of Krishna consciousness. All very nice. Variety is the spice of life. So he's in a Dwarka and he's looking around. This is an amazing place. These Dwarkavasis have so much bhav, so much love for Krishna. His actual words. The happiness found in liberation is said to be supreme. Multiplied many millions of times, it might be said to equal the joy in Vaikuntha. And if any joy still greater can be conceived, it is that which is found in Ayodhya, Jai Sri Ram. But the joy born in Dwarka, how can anyone even begin to describe it? So it's something to be relished, actually. So that's all very nice. But for connoisseurs of spiritual knowledge who are searching for the highest spiritual truth, which means Gaudiya Vaishnavas, actually. So blessed we are that by chance or good fortune we're, we're here because generally it's understood the followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they're aspiring for Goloka Vrindavan and in particular the mood of the Manjaris. Of course, Lord Chaitanya had devotees in different bhavas as well. Some were devotees of Ram, like Anupam, the, um, the brother of Rupan Sanatan. He was a Ram Bhakta. Again, showing that variety is the spice of life because Krishna wants those relationships. <clears throat> but for connoisseurs searching for the highest spiritual truth, there's a deeper understanding of rasa or love for Krishna. <clears throat> that's only found in Vrindavan. And it's more intimate and it's more satisfying to Krishna than worshipping him in awe and reverence. That's a bold statement. It's more satisfying to Krishna, the love of the Brajabhasis, than any other love. More satisfying than the love of the devotees in Mathura, the devotees in Dwarka. How do we know that that's more important to Krishna? Because he said so. Srila Krishna Kaviraj Goswami uh, quotes Krishna, the Supreme Authority, in Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila 316. Knowing my opulences, the whole world looks upon me with awe and veneration. But devotion made feeble by such reverence does not attract me. Knowing my opulences, in general, the whole world looks upon me with awe and veneration. God Almighty, Allah, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet. These are proper statements from bona fide religious texts. But Krishna says, the open secret, <laughs> Prabhupada revealed to us an open secret. Knowing my opulences, the whole world looks upon me with awe and med veneration. But devotion made feeble by such reverence does not attract me. That's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And the Sharyas say that as a result, Krishna experienced, we could say, a type of transcendental frustration when he was in Dwarka because he was surrounded by those in the mood of awe and reverence, but there's that famous saying, I left my heart in Vrindavan, right? It's a t-shirt, it's a sweatshirt. <laughs> I left my heart in Vrindavan. God left his heart in Vrindavan. We, should, we could print a t-shirt like that. God left his heart in Vrindavan. So while in Dwarka, he couldn't reveal his heart in that mood to these exalted residence of Dwarka. He couldn't explain the special love between him and the Brajabhasis. Being in that Aishwarya Bhav and showing so much respect to Krishna, 
How could they understand that in Vrindavan he wrestles with boys in the sand of Raman Rady? He dances with his girlfriends and sometimes kisses them on the cheek. He wouldn't do that in Dwarka. So how, how could they understand? Actually, amongst the residents of Dwarka, there was only a few who actually knew this open secret. It's now an open secret. It's, we're distributing Krishna book all around the world, and there's, it's a summary study of the 10th canto. A summary study of the 10th canto, which is basically the Rajavasis and Krishna, their, devo their loving relationship. It's an open secret now. But at that time in Dwarka, only a few people knew about this Braj Bhakti, the unalloyed love of the residents at Vrindavan for Krishna. And one of them was Rohini. Who's Rohini? Rohini is the mother of Balaram. She had lived in Braj, she had given birth, quote unquote. <laughs> Balaram appeared in her womb, but after some time she had come to Dwarka. So in his frustration, Krishna approached Rohini and he said, Rohini, I have to reveal my heart to you. I'm missing those Brajavasis. Those Brajavasis. He was actually thinking that he would come back to Vrindavan, he said to her. I would like to go back to Vrindavan. So she, she suggested they take some counsel from her son, Lord Balaram. So the three of them had a meeting. Krishna, Rohini, and Balaram. And at that meeting, Krishna asked Rohini, he said, let's, let's all three of us go. <laughs> Krishna and Balaram, let, let, let's all go. What do you think, Rohini? Should we go to Braja secretly without telling Vasudeva and Devaki, who were living in Dwarka? Ro Rohini said, no way, because they will object and forbid you to go. They suffered so much on your behalf. So you should be careful not to disobey them or cause them any pain. You can't go. Now, you're with Vasudeva and Devaki. Break their heart. They're your parents. <clears throat> you have to stay in Dwarka. So, the Charya is described as the three of them sat there. This is amazing. The vision of Mother Yasoda's face in Vrindavan feeling so much separation from Krishna, appeared in all their minds at the same time, and they all started crying. <laughs> so gradually they, they put themselves together and they decided somebody had to go. So Krishna said, who will go to Vrindavan and appease my devotees? And they're all thinking, that person has to be somebody very special a really special person who has to go there and, and appease the Brajabhasis. So Krishna immediately thought of a very special person. Who? Uddhava. How was he special? Well, he was special because he was a personal servant of, of Krishna in Dwarka. And sometimes he advised the Lord, that's the Ras. He was the advisor to Krishna, helping him solve managerial problems. Krishna had no managerial problems here in Vrindavan. He's a cavalry boy. He's footloose and fancy free. And to work, he's got a headache. He's in charge of the kingdom. And if you ever manage the temple, I did, you'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but in a more personal sense, Uddhava was related to Krishna. He was a cousin of Krishna. And it's described that he was so much absorbed in love for Krishna that his personality, his characteristics, and his activities resembled Krishna's in many respects. He looked very much like Krishna. So Krishna made the proposal to Balaram Rohini, I think Uddhava, he, he should go. And everyone agreed. So Krishna immediately sent for Uddhava and he soon arrived, and Krishna sat him down. He gave him the plan. He surrendered whatever Lord wants. If, if it's your desire, I'll go to Vrindavan. And Krishna said, you can take some messages. 
to the Brajabhasis. I'll, I'll write some letters. Letters are more personal than email. I don't like email. I like the handwritten letter. I know once I received a handwritten letter from Srila Prabhupada, it was so touching that it wasn't typed out, it was, it was hand, handwritten. More personal. Anyway, so <clears throat> then Krishna dressed him, dressed Buddha in his own clothes. And then um, he, he escorted him to the chariot that was waiting and he bade him farewell. I mean, there's more to be said, but we only have an hour. I get till 9.30, by the way. They told me the temple president. <laughs> now, Shastra describes that Krishna actually sent Uddhava, as you know, to Vrindavan with messages to the residents there. But also in Shasta we learned that he, he sent Uddhava several times, not just once, both from Dwarka and from Mathura, and from Mathura. For example, Sri Rupa Goswami recounts one such trip to Vrindavan from Mathura in his famous book called Uddhava Sandesh. That, that's one of my favorite books of all time, Uddhava Sandesh. And therein Krishna gives directions to Uddhava and sends him off. He, you know, he, Krishna describes the route from Mathura to Vrindavan, how he'll come across different scenery, divine scenery. He'll come across different exalted devotees and he'll see the cows and he's just preparing him, you know. You take this direction, this is Uddhava Sandesh. And then he sent him um, off with the, with the following words indicating what he would find in Vrindavan. Would you like to hear what Krishna described? His own words of Vrindavan. There are surely many cities throughout the world, each of them blessed by my presence in the form of a presiding deity which can sate the minds of devotees like yourself, Uddhava. But my dear friend, I swear to you again and again, and with all sincerity, that none brings as much joy to my heart as the humble, coward village of Braj. Sri Vrindavan Dham Ki. This is the Lord's desire. So our desires are in accordance with the Lord. So we feel the same way. And that's probably why we're all here <laughs> in this auspicious month of Kartik, sitting at the lotus feet of Radha Shram Sundar. Now arriving from Braj, into, uh, uh, from Dwarka, as, as he was told, Uddhava immediately went to see uh, Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yasoda. With Krishna's message. And upon arriving, he, you know, he very submissively bowed down before Krishna's father and it's described, and Nanda Maharaj embraced the youth. I thought that was interesting. Uddhava is young, like Krishna is young. Krishna, although he's any, the, any, the supreme eternal personality, he never ages beyond 16. So Uddhava is very much like him. So it's described Nanda Maharaj, who appears according to the desire of Purnamasi as the father of Krishna, elderly. But the, a young boy came, actually, you could say, you know, um, Uddhava. So he embraced the youth who so much resembled his son Krishna in many respects. At that point, Nanda Maharaj escorted Uddhava into his inner chambers. You know, the kings have their palaces, and they have their meetings and inner chambers, and introduced him to Mother Yashoda. And after offering Uddhava a, a fitting reception, Nanda Maharaj revealed the contents of her Bhajabhasi's heart. We're so blessed that our acharyas have given us access to the inner recesses of Krishna's heart and Krishna's intimate associates. What other, with all due respect, spiritual tradition can do that? We're looking into the hearts of these devotees and by hearing like that, we become uh, lowly and we, we do like greed to be like them. So what, what was this Brajabhasa, what did Nanda Maharaj 
How did he reveal his heart? Like this. He said to Uddhava, that boy who was the color of a rain cloud, who first entered my heart and lived there for so long, only to take birth from the womb of his mother, Yashoda, tell me, does he remember his father? Does he remember me? O oh, hero, he addresses Uddhava, O oh, hero, tell me, does he who no longer is no longer with us remember his mother who fed him daily her breast milk? Who was always anxious for his safety and who has not opened her eyes since he left us? Yashoda sure didn't open her eyes. She was just devastated. It's described that their household, there were cobwebs everywhere. The milk that was boiling on the stove had long, you know, become dry. It was a very you know, difficult scene for Uddhava. Uddhava was like, what's going on here? So Uddhava tried to pacify Nanda and Yashoda by reading Krishna's letter to them. I have the letter. Well, I don't have it, but I found it. W would you like to hear the letter? Yeah. Krishna's letter to his parents, Nanda Yashoda. Don't worry, my dear parents, Nanda and Yashoda Mai. I'm the supreme truth. I'm the supreme pure. I'm the eternal person. Everyone is dependent on me, so you must not feel disconnected from me. <laughs> so when Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yasoda heard that message, they couldn't believe their ears. This is their son. So they objected. Mother Yasoda said, Krishna's not the supreme pure. Here in Vrindavan, he would roll in the dust every day, and I'd have to bathe him. Then Nanda Maharaj, she said, hey, he's not the supreme truth. He would steal butter, <laughs> and we would catch him, and I'd have to chastise him, and he would deny it. He would lie. How can a liar be the supreme truth? It's so relishable, isn't it? These... Then Madhya Soda said, he's not the eternal person. He took birth from me. He's my little boy. We saw him grow up with our own eyes. So Uddhava, this is his first experiencing seeing Braj Bhakti. And he realized that by the potency of Yoga Maya, Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yasoda did not realize that their son was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They just saw, saw him as the most lovable son. And meditating on this, we can introduce this idea now. Spontaneous love, not Aishvarya, but this spontaneous love of these two Brajabhasis. Uddhava, a resident of stately Dwarka, that's a good way to put it, a resident of stately Dwarka said, these Brajabhasis have such an intimate love for Krishna. They're thinking that the king has become their son. That's how he thought, because he saw Krishna as the king. <laughs> They're thinking the king has become their son. He couldn't believe it. So he left. And the next morning, he bathed in a lake called Krishna Kund in Braj. It's all new to him. Beautiful lake called Krishna Kund. He dressed in fresh clothes. He performed his morning rites. Then he went to a grove of trees near Nandagram. Nandagram, of course, is where Krishna lived as a young boy. As an infant, he lived in Gokul, but too many demons were coming, so Nanda Maharaj shifted to Nandagram. Radha was born in Raval. She appeared in Raval. Around the same time, uh, her parents moved to Varshana. The transcendental plot is thickening. <laughs> so Uddhava went to a grove of trees near to Nandagram. It was actually uh, a grove of trees that belonged to Vishaka Saki. Because all the Sakis, they have properties as well, where they welcome Radha and Krishna for their pastimes. So near to Nandagram, um, it, it was a grove of trees that were tended to by Vishaka. <clears throat> and it's now called Uddhava Giri or uh, Uddhava Gyari. And there the gopis were anxiously waiting for him, having been informed in advance that a messenger was coming uh, with a, a letter from Krishna. You can imagine. Krishna's been gone for so long and now they're getting a letter 
the first communication from Krishna after he's gone. Like, oh my gosh, the heart was beating in great expectation. Now when Uddha arrived, he was startled by the way these gopis looked. He, he was startled. Their hair was loose and their clothes were soiled. Their lips were cracked and their faces were dried up. Actually, their, their bodily luster had just faded away. And their eyes looked startled like those of a frightened deer. He thought, who, who are these young girls? They certainly can't be the extraordinary girls that Krishna had to describe to him before he left Dwarka. He, they, they, and, and, and amongst them, he, they all looked despondent. He didn't see any special one that Krishna had indicated. There's one special girl. But he thought, they couldn't be anybody else, because <laughs> they're gopis. And there's only gopis in Vrindavan, coward boys and gopis. So at this point, Srila Vishwanath Chagavati Thakur describes something really amazing. He writes that upon seeing Uddhava dressed in Krishna's clothes, the Bhajagopis Bajago became, just to see Uddhava dressed like Krishna in his clothes and having that semblance of Krishna, uh, the gopis became so radiant with love that their unkept appearance gave way to their original beauty like an actor's mask suddenly removed. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> The Gopi became, seeing him, just reminded, a stimulus for ecstatic love. A stimulus for ecstatic love. We're giving lec a series of lectures now on YouTube, and we're up to 52. We, we've spoken on 52 stimulations for ecstatic love. Braj is just pregnant with rasa. So seeing him, they became so radiant with love that their unkept appearance gave way to their original beauty, like an actor's mask suddenly removed. So while Uddhava was in deep uh, thoughts like that, such meditation, the gopis came to examine him. Who is, who is this boy? <laughs> and Vishnuath writes that, as they stared at his long limbs, lotus eyes, moon-like face, fresh youth, that, that combined to create a beauty they'd only seen in Krishna, they became stunned. We, we've only seen Krishna like this. How is it that you look like Krishna? So they gathered around him like bees about a honey flower. So nice. You know, we see bees, that, you see a nice fresh flower, you know, been in the garden, the, the bees come. It's refreshing to see things like that. Like one time Prabhupada said in New Maipar, the best view from a window is a body of water or a cow. We are in New Mayapur. He's on his He just said, said something so practical. He said, when looking out the, a window, because there was a window there, and he said, the best view is to see a body of water or a cow. When you want to go there. So seeing Uddhava, this so attractive, like Krishna, they, they hovered around him like bees do on a honey flower. Then they offered him a seat at the base of a, uh, a kadamba tree. And Uddhava had the letter from Krishna. He took out the letter and he started reading it to them. As soon as he started reading Krishna's words, to the gopis, Radharani fainted. And seeing this profound expression of devotion, you know, you get a letter from somebody and you faint, it's something. Get a letter from Krishna and you're his dearest, she fainted. Seeing this profound expression of devotion, Uddhava stopped reading. He didn't want to go on because Radharani fell unconscious. And he unfolded, he, he had a silken cloth, he unfolded the silken cloth, which contained a garland worn by Krishna. He had brought from Dwarka 
some tadiya. Tadiya means that which is in relationship to Krishna. There was a garland, a used garland, but in the spiritual world, used doesn't mean like used here. It always remains fresh. Krishna is decorated with a Vajayanti, Vajayanti garland. Five type of flowers going down to his ankles. It, it never wilts, it's always fresh. So this garland from Dwarka, which, which was fresh, but it was, had the scent of Krishna's body. And Krishna had sent this garland um, just for this occasion, having foreseen that Radha would faint when she heard his words. So Uddhava took that garland with the scent of Krishna's body, put it around the neck of Radha, she immediately woke up. Stimulus to ecstatic love. And at that point, um, he, he, well, he continued reading the letter. And in the letter it said as follows, My dear girls, you may think I have left you, but in fact I haven't really left you. Relief. Just consider that I am in everyone's heart. I'm in your hearts, and I'm in every atom. So how have I left you? There's no reason to lament. There's no reason to cry, because we're as connected as ever before. The Gobi's like, what? They're shocked. They just looked at each other. And they said, wait a minute, Krishna's treating us like jnanis. But we're simple village girls. We're not interested in complicated philosophy. We just, we just miss Krishna. We just want to be with him again. Does he really love us? Whatever the case, we always love him. So hearing the gopis, you know, they were going deeper into Braj Bhakti here. Hearing the gopis speak like this, speak like this Uddhava thought to himself, I thought I appreciated Krishna. I thought I loved Krishna. But these girls love him unconditionally. Unlike any other devotees I've ever seen before. So Srila Jiva Goswami, one of our greatest heroes, Srila Jiva Goswami, has written a nice verse in this regard, showing Uddhava's appreciation for the gopis' love for Krishna, especially Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani. He writes, it's a little long, but it's just pure nectar. <coughs> Even Uddhava, a devotee considered by Lord Hari to be as dear as his own self, said that Sri Lakshmi Devi can never match the gopis. That same Uddhava also repeatedly paid obeisances to the dust of the feet of these gopis. Among all, among all those gopis, however, is one who has a body composed entirely of the moon nectar of love for Lord Krishna, the moon nectar of love. This is poetry. What is the use of a bowman's arrow unless it pierces the heart of his enemy? And what is the use of poetry unless it pierces the heart and awakens love for Radha and Krishna? <clears throat> he goes on. In the presence of that moon nectar love, Krishna sways, behaves like a chakora bird and always follows in her footsteps. We all offer our obeisances to that all worshipful Shri Radhika. So we've gone from Vatsalya Ras to Madhurya Ras, and now we've gone to the pinnacle of Madhurya Ras in the personality of um, Srimati Radhika. So we can appreciate that Uddhava was particularly impressed by Radharani's love for Krishna, especially when he witnessed her divine madness, like divine madness, in mistaking a bumblebee as a messenger from Krishna. Her state at, at that time is called divine madness, and it was, I think, well, obviously there was, I'm, we're ahead here in this particular verse today from that particular pastime where the bee came, and there was a one, you know, there was a one-way conversation. <laughs> And between her and the bee, she just spoke to the bee. You're an unreliable servant of an unreliable master. And um, it's very, very deep. And we could speak for hours on it, but 
Her words, you could say, have been the subject matter of many great uh, saints and sages, analyzing what is bhakti or pure devotion uh, to Krishna in the highest stage. We know her as one of three personalities who has Mahabhav, the pinnacle of love for Krishna. Her, uh, Madhavinda Puri, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the amazing thing is that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came just 500 years ago after a long history of Vedic culture going back millenniums. He appeared <coughs> one moment ago in cosmic time and introduced this Braj Bhakti, this unalloyed pure love for Krishna. It's not about me, it's all about you, in essence, in pure love, to the people of Kali Yuga. Therefore, when Rupa Goswami first saw Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for the very first time with his own eyes at Ram Keli, which is not far from here, it's a three hour drive, in a little village just next to Ram Keli, his eyes first set on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. What words came from his heart? Namo Mahabhadanaya Krishna Prem Padayate Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Nambe Guru Chushaya. Who are you? You're the most munificent incarnation because you're giving this pure love of Krishna, this Braj Bhakti, to the people of Kali Yuga. What could be more amazing than that? So that love, <coughs> her love is called Mahabhav, and it has two forms. It, in, in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, it goes into great detail. Um, one form is advanced, which is found in the queens of, uh, of Dwarka, and the other is highly advanced, which is visible only in the, the Brajagopis, the milkmaids of Vrindavan. And this highly advanced ecstasy of the gopis has two further subdivisions. One is displayed when meeting Krishna, it's called Madhana. We're getting into detail here, but love is in the details. And the other is in separation from Krishna, it's called Mohana. And it was this Mohana or ecstasy and separation that Uddhava witnessed in Sri Radha and the uh, gopis of Vrindavan. Their love was very intense in separation. We're getting back to the original part uh, of our talk. Separation makes the heart go fonder. It ultimately, separation is higher than meeting. Again, it's a science. That Shasta says there's four different types of separation. Talk about a science. We just talk about, you know, my husband's traveling or my wife's away or my kids, I'm feeling separation. But in bhakti, the feelings are very deep, but it's also somewhat rational because it can be explained by philosophy. It's not just sentiment. Prabhupada said religion without philosophy is sentimentalism. And philosophy without religion is speculation. We have very deep, deep, we're aspiring, you know, we are aspiring, we, okay, we, we know who we are, we know where we're going, we know these things, it's not that we don't know, we know, we don't feel qualified, we're very humble, but we know. We know that there's separation and by the mercy of personalities like Rupa Goswami, Vishnath, Jagavati Thakur, we know there's four kinds of separation. Um, worth mentioning. Like, how are the gopis, what are the different types of separation the Braja gopis experience? It's more important than the evening news, you know, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, you know, this, we tend to see those things, you know, they take a peek and look away. This is more important. So there's Purvarag, there's Mana, there's Pravasa, and there's Prema Vachitya. You should have those words on the tip of your tongue. And the first one, Purvarag, is described that even before you meet your lover, you're anticipating separation. Like, if I fall in love with him, what if he leaves? Now this is typical with the younger gopis, because they're observing Krishna from a distance at every opportunity. Krishna goes, you know, from Nandagram to herd the cows in the forest with his friends, and you know, by social custom, boys and girls don't mix, so they're just looking at Krishna go by on the way, and they get attached. Who wouldn't get attached coming to the temple and seeing how beautifully Radha and Krishna are dressed? Here he is in his deity form. You fall in love. <clears throat> 
So he's going with his friends and they get attached to him, but they can't meet him. So when he goes, in, they feel separation. They never met him, but they're already feeling separation. This is Purva Rav. Interesting, right? And the second type of separation is called mana. In mana, you're with your lover, but you know one day you will be separated. But you don't want they to that day to come. Tomorrow always comes too soon. Remember that slogan? Tomorrow always comes too soon. So you're with, before you weren't with, but now the gopis are with, and they're thinking, what if he leaves? And the third type of separation is called pravasa. It means you're actually separated. Your lover, Krishna we're talking about, not... For example, when Krishna left Vrindavan, the residence of Vrindavan, Vishnuav says they drowned in pravasa. He writes, they drowned in pravasa. And this sentiment, this, this, this uh, pravasa, it's perfectly described by Mahaprabhu. Oh, Govinda, feeling your separation, I'm considering a moment to be like 12 years or more. Tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain. I'm feeling all vacant. He actually left. And the fourth mood of separation, it's very deep and esoteric. It's called prema vaichitya. Prema vaichitya means that you're feeling separation although your lover is right next to you. I mean, that's, we don't find that in the material world, but there is a pastime, we don't have time now, where Radha and Krishna were together, but Purnamasi arranged it such that Radharani is thinking Krishna is gone, and Krishna is thinking Radharani is gone. It's deep. It's deep. So again, you know, we're, we're just, now we're just thinking getting connected. No? Religion, the, the verb regulio in religion means to, to be connected, just like yoga means to reconnect. So that's our business right now. Don't, don't worry too much about separation. Get connected. How do you get connected right here and now? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. But know the philosophy. Know the complete understanding given by uh, our acharyas like Rupa Goswami and Raghunath Das Goswami, Shanatan Goswami, Kaviraj Goswami, know the philosophy that actually separation is considered a higher form of love. And actually Sri Rupa Goswami quotes Radharani herself in verse uh, 240 of Padyavali. That was his person, just like our Iskand Shloka Wala is Vaisheshika Prabhu. There's no greater Shloka Wala in Iskand, I say it publicly in front of the microphone. Then, that's really nice. <clears throat> so Rupa Goswami had his verse book too, and he called it Padyavali. And that's another one of my favorite books. So in there, he quotes Radharani how she sees separation from Krishna. Would you like to hear her? This is what she said one time. Separation from Krishna is better than meeting him. When I meet him, there's only one Krishna. But when I'm separated from him, the three worlds become filled with Krishna. Huh? <laughs> You're with the person, there's an exchange. But isn't it when someone's gone, it's so many memories in three seconds. So the smaranam is also equal in one sense to being with Krishna, remembering him. And Srila Vishnu Chagabhari Thakur explains this so nicely <coughs> in his commentary to uh, Uj Lamani, which was written by Rupa Goswami. He's revealing Krishna's mood about separation. We heard Radha, I prefer separation. Right, okay. Krishna too, ultimately. Vishnu explains this in his commentary to Ujvalu Nilamani. Krishna is speaking. If I had to choose between union and separation, I would prefer separation from my beloved because in union I see her only in one place, whereas in separation my entire universe is filled with her. Same. But the gopis of Vrindavan, their whole mood, these young cowherd girls who make cow patties and cook and, you know, clean with the 
you know, the streets with the broom like that. They, their whole mood is to bring Radha and Krishna together. The Sakis, there's eight Sakis. Each Saki has eight girls who help her. If you look at the, you know, a broad spectrum of Vrindavan Leela, it's all about meeting and separation. Sambhog and Vipralamba. That, that's what's basically happening. It's a central theme. And the gopis can't stand it when the divine couple are separated. They feel the pangs of separation. So their whole mood is to bring Radha and Krishna together. But this, Wandacharya has explained this separation from Krishna is, is the essential, he calls it the essential ingredient. Essential ingredient because it makes the meeting sweeter. That's the whole idea. Separation, and you come, like there's classic photos from World War II, the guys come back from war and then the, the girl comes and jumps into his arm. <laughs> They've been separated for four years. I just, I don't like to use material analogies, but analogies make philosophical points easier to understand. So the essential ingredient in, in devotional service is separation because when they meet, it's like the first time. That's another phenomenon of Braj. The pastimes seem to happen over and over, right? Every day he goes to see the cows, every day he meets Radharani, every day, you know. But Purnamasi makes it that although the pastimes are being repeated, every time it feels like the first time. And there's always something wonderful about the first time, right? The first time you met your best friend, the first time you talked to your wife, your husband, the first time you tasted a gulab jamun. <laughs> was never the same after. <laughs> It'll get better, don't worry. <laughs> so, the essential ingredient in um, devotional service is separation, because it makes the meeting sweeter. And this is confirmed, and guess where? In Navadvip Dham Mahatmya, chapter 14, it said, just as one cannot redden cloth without the use of red dye, in the same way, the happiness of amorous love cannot reach its fullness without there having been separation of lovers. Don't let the bell distract you. That was Prabhupada's instruction. That every hour the bell should ring, so we worship that bell. <clears throat> but listen again. <clears throat> Just as one cannot redden cloth without the use of red dye, in the same way, the happiness of amorous love cannot reach its fullness without there having been separation of the lovers. It all makes sense. Krishna consciousness makes sense. It's very deep. But if we're uh, loading, we're greedy to understand it. We read these things, oh, now I understand. And, and I found a, a quote by Lord Ramachandra in the same context because you know, the Ramayana is also full of loving pastimes. When Prahlad was a boy growing up, the Ramayana was his favorite book. I don't know, maybe he's, he's moved on, but I'm sure it's still a favorite. Because it's all about love. It's all about love. All the songs today on, on the internet, the radio, it's all about love, but it's the iron love compared to the gold love of the Brajabhasis. So Lord Ram says about separation, He's speaking to Sita. My dear wife, there are two ways my devotees feel love for me. In union with me and in separation from me. Although my eternal associates like you and my mother <laughs> desire union, I mercifully give them separation because the distress of separation from me is actually the topmost bliss. And the union that follows yields a happiness a million times greater than before. Jai Sri Ram! Yes. Death to Ravana! Oh, that's another class. <laughs> so when we hear Radharani and the gopis, you know, in conclusion here, uh, feeling separation, we shouldn't think they're suffering. It may appear like that, but it's not. We certainly don't want to make uh, the mistake of Ramchandra Puri, woo, who criticized his guru, Madhavinda Puri, on his deathbed. At that time, Madhavinda Puri, who I mentioned, was one of the three who understands Mahabhav and how it's um, assisted by separation. When, when he was on his deathbed, 
um, he called out to Krishna in a mood of separation, as the gopis did when Krishna left Vrindavan. He said, it's classic, it's one of the classic verses in, in our Krishna conscious philosophy. O oh my Lord, O oh merciful Master, O oh Master of Mathura, when shall I see you again? Because I'm, of my not seeing you, my agitated heart has become unsteady. O oh most beloved one, what shall I do now? We used to sing that on Sankatan in 1971 on the streets of Detroit. O oh my Lord, O oh gracious to the lowly, thou art now living in Mathura. When will thou come to me, O oh darling mine? My heart is burning in pains of separation. Oh, what shall I do? Oh, what shall I do? And the people of Detroit would stop and like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Baholasla is a, one of my first God brothers I met. He was a good singer. He said, oh my Lord, oh gracious, boom, 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 to the lowly, thou art now living in Mathura. When will come thou to me, everybody? <laughs> Darling mine, my heart is burning in separation. Whoa, well, what shall I do? Like, people are like, I said to him, let's just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> They'll get there. So this was, this was Madhavinda Puri. He was singing like this on his deathbed. But Ramchandra Puri foolishly said, Guru Maharaj, why are you lamenting like a worldly man as you die? He didn't understand. Another disciple was there who understood his spiritual master, was actually experiencing Vipralambhava, the mood of separation. And because of that understanding and the excellent, excellent service, it was a menial service, but excellently executed um, to his Guru Maharaj, Madhavinda Puri, uh, that personality, Ishwara Puri, Ishwara Puri, he later became the spiritual master of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we don't want to be like Ramachandra and misunderstand these things. We're explaining it very clearly. It's an elevated subject matter, Vipalamba Bhav, but I'm speaking about it today because that's the verse. That's the verse. And even as neophyte devotees, um, we're being educated in this subject. For example, in the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust, publication, Elevation to Krishna, chapter 5, Prabhupada says, those who follow the teachings of Lord Chaitanya should experience and relish the feelings of separation, not meeting. That's a very deep statement by Srila Prabhupada. Sometimes they say, Prabhupada didn't give us everything. Hello, did you read Srila Prabhupada's books before you said such an outrageous thing? Those who follow the teachings of Lord Chaitanya should experience and relish the feelings of separation, not meaning. And in Krishna book, in the beginning, towards the introduction, I can't remember, Prabhupada said, this Krishna book will give solace to my disciples or my followers when they come to the stage of feeling separation from Krishna. We'll just pick up Krishna book and we can read the summary study of the 10th canto. All glorious to Sridhar Prabhupada. So the Acharyas say that having seen the gopis' uh, uh, profound ecstasies, including Radharani's madness, Uddhava acknowledged <coughs> that within the treasure chest of Braj Bhakti, the most valuable jewel was the sparkling diamond of the gopis' love, especially Srimati Radharani. This is what Uddhava realized. Within the treasure chest of Braj Bhakti, <clears throat> the most valuable jewel was the sparkling diamond of the gopis' love, especially Shivaji Radharani. And the Acharyas say that Krishna had sent Uddhava to Vrindavan with messages for the Brajabhasis and um, to personally witness the gopis' glories. But the Lord's real intention was to reveal the supremacy of Radharani's love for Krishna. That's the deeper understanding. Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani Ki. Because she's in charge of devotional service. She's in charge of love. So we, we want to love Radha and Krishna. So we first appeal to her. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. 
So I'm going to finish today. <clears throat> I'm on time. Oh, well, really? I'm, I'm on time. Uh, a beautiful verse from Srila, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite devotees, uh, Prabhonanda Saraswati, Vindavan Mahimamrita, and he, other books he wrote as well, like Radharasa Sudhanidhi, all about Srimati Radharani, very deep verse, uh, book as well. We'll finish with verse 259. While holding in my heart the desire to attain the supremely cherished service of Sri Radha's lotus feet, I always meditate on Krishna wearing a crown of peacock feathers. I sing Krishna's name in kirtan, I serve his lotus feet and murmur his best of mantras. When, by Krishna's mercy, will Shishi Radha Madhava's grand festival of divine love arise in my heart? Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Shishi Gaurnitai ki, Shri Krishna Balaram ki, Shishi Vara Shamasundar ki, Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani ki, Uddhava ki, Song of the Bee ki, Kartik 2023 Vrindavan Dham ki, Nitai Gaur J J Radhe Shine. Hare Krishna, thank you.